Ladies and gentlemen of the press, Comrade Bruce has already explained the reason for my lateness. The only mistake she made is when she said I had an appointment. Actually, I had four appointments. But I want to apologize to you sincerely. If agreement on the adjustment program can be reached, please comment on or react to this statement in the light of the welcome news of the World Bank that Guyana has realized a 5% growth over the last year. Depends on your definitions. When you speak of Guyana being able to up to insignificant balance of payment support from the IMF. What is significant? If you have a gap of X 
and the IMF can only guarantee half X, you would hardly call that significant. And secondly, the World Bank, the IMF proposals as they stand at the moment would necessitate are reducing substantially employment in the public sector. It would mean also removing subsidies from some very vital services or commodities. The IMF program, in fact, in our judgment, would bring about certain unwelcome social consequences such as we have seen in the Dominican Republic, such as we've seen in many countries in South America. Now, as I understand it, the World Bank does not give funds in support of balance of payments. The World Bank's disbursements are project-oriented. We have been able to get a number of loans from the World Bank for particular projects like a large forestry project up the Demerara River. I think electricity and also bauxite. Uh, that we have shown, according to the World Bank statistics, a growth of 5% during 1984 is indicative of what we have been able to do without IMF support. Mr. Burnham, certainly you bring to this heads of government conference. Are you satisfied now uh, that the discussions have finished? Well, I, there is only one particular issue which was of a Guyanese nature which I brought to the conference, and that is the failure of many of the CARICOM territories to buy Guyana surplus sugar instead of buying Dominican Republic sugar. Otherwise, my concerns and issues, I would say, were regional. So far as, this, as was possible and practical, I am satisfied with the results of the summit just concluded. Mr. Burnham. Of sugar. Many countries are saying that Ghana sugar is too expensive. It's something, something like, something like four times the world price. Have these allegations been true? Not Your multiple may be wrong, but your principle is right. But you must understand the background to it. When Guyana in 1974 and 75 was getting 615 per ton. And those were not the weak pound that we know today. Guyana agreed on a formula which led Guyana to sell sugar to Caribbean deficit countries at a much lower price. Our argument is that it's a give and take world. When we could get 650 pounds a ton, we sell it much cheaper to our Caricom brothers. Now that the bottom has fallen out of the world market price, it is only fair that we get the, the same price because we lost millions of pounds uh, selling sugar at the lower price in 74 and 75. Sir, it's a rough time economically now. Is it, isn't it a bit difficult asking the CARICOM countries to uh, take uh, expensive sugar at a time like this? It is not expensive sugar. It is sugar which covers the cost of production. There are many Caribbean products which Diana takes, purchases, which are more expensive uh, than their alternatives from other sources. Can you give any examples, sir? 
steal from Trinidad, uh, for instance. Uh, and it seems to me that the purpose of a common market is sell it cheap. And when the price of sugar is low, to have no market, and the price at which we contend our sugar should be bought, though there is some flexibility, is a price that was agreed. It is not a price imposed by Guyana. To what extent uh, have you been able to get uh, an undertaking from the OECD that they will, in fact, uh, buy Guyana should it out? that to purchase this sugar would provide a means of Guyana's liquidating, in part, its indebtedness to CMCF. Are you satisfied with that? You speak of it as an illusion. An illusion. Uh, an illusion. illusion. You know, illusion. in life and politics, as in mathematics, you have to accept the highest common factor. In the Caribbean, uh, our report circulated that uh, there's a security amendment bill that is causing much concern to some opposition groupings at home. Could you clarify the position on this security amendment bill? First of all, it is not a bill. It is now an act, having been passed by the parliament and assented to by the president. But secondly, it is something uh, that is provided for under the present constitution and under all of the constitutions under which we have operated from the time I was in politics. Thirdly, it is only, uh, it gives us, the government, power to do certain things in certain instances. It is also part of the paraphernalia of all states in the world, whether they be, they be the Soviet Union or Poland or the United States, the United Kingdom. In fact, in the United Kingdom, you much have a much harsher piece of legislation referred to as the Prevention of Terrorism Act. I should also like to remark uh, that we used to reenact every year by resolution to this particular piece of legislation. My colleagues advised me, and I accepted their advice, that rather than going to the House every year, let us put it permanently on the statute books, and it is permissive and not obligatory. We may invoke it if the necessity arises. If no necessity arises, we will not invoke it. And it is intended to be as protective of the opposition as of the government. In fact, the government itself has the means to protect itself much more successfully than the opposition. Recently, the leader of the minority, the minority leader, called on our Minister of Home Affairs to point out to him that he had information that there were certain threats to him issuing from Guyanese domiciled or resident in Canada, that his life was in danger. He asked for protection. We did give him such protection as he was willing to accept. And we were rather concerned about his state of nervousness. And this is as protective of him as it is of us. As I said before, we have the capacity formally and informally to take care of ourselves uh, much more successfully and condignly than as the leader of the minority. Does your government consult? you give us any idea about over what period the government hopes to honor its debt obligations to member states of the community? I saw one report this morning suggesting that in the case of Barbados, um, the time frame might be five years. We do not owe Barbados. We are indebted to the CMCF as a result of an indebtedness to Trinidad. Barbados, because it had a surplus 
in trade with Trinidad has become the creditor to CMCF. It is nothing that we took from Barbados. It is what we had taken from Trinidad. Provided our economy continues to turn around as it has shown signs of doing a 5% growth, real growth, last year, are provided in CARICOM, they buy, they purchase Guyana commodities, we will be able to pay off in a short time. That's one of the things about the sugar. We have millions of dollars of sugar we can sell, but we can't sell it in the Caribbean. If we sold it in the Caribbean, we would attend uh, the benefit of such sale to the CMCF. But I think five years is a reasonable period considering or assuming, A, that a, the, the upturn in our economy continues and that the Caribbean purchases Guyana commodities, which are alternatives to commodities they purchase from outside of the region. It does take care of Trinidad in a complicated matter, which would take too long to explain. And that was the subject matter of my discussions with Mr. George Chambers, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, ma'am? I gather that your CARICOM counterpart, the other head, valued very much your lines of argument and the way in which you approach certain issues. Do you think that that might have helped towards augmenting the interest in what you're doing in Guyana and in terms of your bilaterals with them? Was anything significant realized or is showing some progress? Well, first of all, we're the oldest. Mm -hmm. We're the longest serving. All other things being equal, we have more experience. Uh, secondly, I think that we are the one territory that takes most seriously our CARICOM commitments. Imagine buying soap from Dominica for twice the price we can get it from the GDR. Imagine buying oil from the Caribbean at a price higher than we can get it out of Holland. Imagine buying steel at a price higher than we can get it from extra regional sources. Guyana has embarked on its own course, a course of self-reliance, a course of taking advantage of its resources and trading those resources in and out of the region. Uh, for instance, in exchange for rice and preserved tropical fruit, we get industrial equipment from the GDR. To give one example, we ask no one to adopt our tactics. We merely do our own thing. We honor our CARICOM commitments. And if there is anyone who feels what we are doing is worth looking at, well, we are very happy. But there must be something to what we're doing. When we modestly estimated our growth at 2%, and the World Bank, after a deeper study, estimated at 5% real growth. President, given the decline of the importing certain commodities from certain mm -hmm. we here, elections in Guyana were not free and fair, that your government has now said no to uh, outside observers. Some people may suggest to you that you seem to have something to hide. What do you say to that allegation? 
I say is nonsense. We are not a colony. Does anyone think of sending to the United States to observe their elections when there are tales about ghosts voting in Cook County? When there were the allegations of fraud by a former President Ford is a piece of impudence. We run Guyana. Let us settle our differences in Guyana. Lord Chitness, I mean. <laughs> and uh, Lord Avery had better apply their efforts to matters which concern them. You see, there are some members of my opposition who remind me of a statement. You can take a man out of a colony, but you cannot take the colony out of some men. What authority has Chitness, Avery, and the rest are over Guyana? Mr. President. This is not Namibia that is in a process. This is not Zimbabwe that, that was in a process. This is the independent cooperative republic of Guyana. But sir, um, it would seem therefore that uh, there's some inconsistency here because you were in power when you allowed uh, a mission to visit um, Guyana on, as an observer uh, with, a, with observer status at the last general election. Did I? <clears throat> you certainly seem to know more of what I did than I do. There are some people who do things in their sleep. Maybe I fall into that category. Mr. President. I didn't object to their coming to Guyana. Well, I didn't tell them they could come and observe us. They, they did, but they were there. Uh, for a few hours. The point is that the, the fact that they were allowed to come into to Guyana to observe the election would suggest to us that um, you, you, you gave up the, the, the same principles that you hold so dear now. Ah, you have made a good point. That it is our right to say when they may come or when they may not come. I'm tired of these busybodies. Let them go and mind their own farmyards. But, sir, how can we take such a, uh, a line uh, when you're going to find yourself, when we get up and we talk about apartheid in South Africa, uh, people... Uh, and that is because you fall into the fallacy of believing that a charge is a proven offense. <laughs> there are the courts. Courts which have given decisions against the government ad nausea. Mr. President, can you give us an indication that there's actually an Father always told me, it's a sign of maturity when you read not only what is on the lines, but what is between the lines. Do you think it's also a sign of weakness that the only member charge of the Caribbean community is so afraid? No, 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 young man, listen. You do not make assumptions. You cannot give a judgment when asking a question. Okay. I'll not okay. Very well. <laughs> Is it any, uh, except Guyana, all other member territories of the Caribbean community, which La Guyana claim to believe in multi-party democracy, find no problem whatsoever in having anyone who so desires so come and observe the conduct of their election. Has anyone asked to go to any other country? Next question. Are you still batting very strong on the question of uh, sport on apartheid? I noticed that. I don't bat. I'm not a cricketer. We have a firm stand. Um, <laughs> are you still playing it on its merits? Whether uh, the, those who have played this, like Gooch and others who have played in South Africa, will still not be allowed to play in Guyana? Gooch, if anything, has exacerbated his offense by stating that he will go to South Africa again. In which case, we do not decide whether he should be a member of the English team. We, in the exercise of a sovereign right of control over immigration, will not permit him to come to Guyana. But what of other people who have been to uh, South Africa and might not necessarily have stated their intention to go to Guyana? That is a matter of consultation at the moment, and I should prefer not to discuss it any further. Mr. President, earlier in this conference, you said that you hunting means to protect yourself more formally and informally, sir. What do you mean? <laughs> Just what I said. <laughs> Think about it. 
Is that what I answer, sir? No, it's a waste of time. <laughs> years in, uh, in, in the region and the integration movement, uh, what would you say are the reasons that, you know, it's still at this point where, you know, a major agreement at this meeting was to implement things that were agreed to be implemented at the last meeting. Um, why has progress been so difficult? A number of reasons. The main reason is the economic crisis which has hit the region in common with other development developing countries in the world. Uh, the second one is that the integration movement is still gathering momentum. You see, in the Caribbean, uh, politics and economics have been a centrifugal rather than centripetal, or rather centripetal in terms of the mother country or North America. I'll give you an example. You know, we shipped by request pigeon peas to a certain Caribbean country. <clears throat> and the consignee said he couldn't sell them because the consumer said they didn't look like Florida peas. You have problems like that. And these all contribute to what may appear to be the sloth of the integration movement. Was there a discussion, I mean, when the discussion comes up here of regional security, regional security systems, is that, does that involve all the membership or, because I, I know there are maneuvers planned by the U.S. military in the region in September that I presume Guyana will not be involved in and several other members will not be involved in. I may be wrong, but my impression is that that is a question that's exciting the, the mind of the OECS territories rather than the rest of the Caribbean. Guyana is not involved in, it. in practice. Academically, it is. Your question and that will be... Favors, in return for favors uh, that I give them. Thank you and goodbye. The election is now over. A hard and at times bitter campaign has come to an end. On the results, the People's National Congress, in the interests of peace and stability in Guyana, has agreed with the support of the United Force to form the government. One of the more serious tasks facing us at this moment is the attainment of independence at the earliest point of time. One of the disturbing features of the election, which we have noted, is the apparent cleavage existing in our society, brought about by colonialism and seven years of mismanagement and misrule. It has come to our knowledge that despite the years of disaster suffered by the people of this country, a large section of the electorate was persuaded against its best interests to vote for the party formerly in power as a result of the dishonest and opportunist propaganda that, unless that party was returned to power, those people would suffer. The new government, headed by me, intends to show by its actions in the immediate future, and indeed throughout its term of office, that this is not true. The problem of racial cleavage, racial antagonism and distrust, which the last government allowed to develop during its term of office, is still with us. But our government recognizes this as a challenge which it intends to accept and which it is determined to overcome. My government considers that it is a matter of the greatest importance and the utmost urgency that an atmosphere of relaxation be established immediately. The reduction of tension, which is already apparent and which will become more pronounced with every passing day when it is realized that not only are we intent on being fair and just, but also that we have at our disposal the means to carry out our intention 
is merely the first fruits of our attainment of office. Enemies of this country would like to see racial division and antagonism continue. They will not have that satisfaction. The government recognizes that its duty is to rule in the interests of all the people of this country. It will dispel the fears of the apprehensive and confound the hopes of those who seek the destruction of this country. To be specific, this government holds that all the people of this country are equally important, whether they belong to a large group or to a small group. To us, the Amerindians are important. To us, the Chinese are important. To us, the Portuguese are important. To us, the Europeans are important. To us, the mixed races are important. To us, the Africans are important. To us, the Indians are important. In short, all Guyanese are important and valued members of our community, and we cherish them and consider that as a government, it is our duty and privilege to guard, protect, and further the real interests of all. It would appear that the would-be destroyers of this country have sought to convince our Indian citizens that they have cause to fear because of the removal of the former government. We can assure our Indian citizens here and now that rather than cause for fear, they have much to hope for from the new government. This government is not bent on the confiscation of property. This government will not pursue policies likely to bring the races into collision. This government will maintain law and order. This government, while in office, will never declare its impotence to see that the lives and property and personal safety of any citizens are protected. We are fully aware that attempts will be made in the future, as in the past, to create disturbances. All of us know who are likely to create disturbances and who think that they have some benefit to be derived from chaos and violence. We have no benefit to derive from such things and we will stamp out firmly and ruthlessly any disruption of the calm and studied and steady progress which we are determined to establish and maintain in this country for the good of all. We ask for time, patience, understanding. The damage done over the last seven years cannot be repaired in a day. We cannot and will not condone and accept the nepotism and corruption of the past seven years. Changes are necessary and changes will be made. But no one who is honest and possessed of ability need have the least apprehension. The results of the election and the formation of our government are not to be considered a victory for one party, but a triumph for the whole Guyanese people. There is nothing to gloat over. Nobody is pantap. But all of us are, I am sure, sobered by the realization of how near we came to having our country destroyed and how arduous were our endeavors to give this country the chance to live, to breathe, to survive. It has been reported to me uh, that some established organizations have made representatives, representations to the British government about Guyanese affairs. I wish to announce that in the immediate future I shall seek to hold discussions with the Mahasabha, the Hindu organization, the United Sider Islamic Anjuman, Ascria, Gale, the Chinese Association, and of course with the Archbishop of the West Indies, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Georgetown, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the Congregational Conference, the Methodist Body, and other religious and cultural organizations. My purpose as Premier is to establish a consultative democracy. And now that the majority of the Guyanese electorate 
has declared in favour of the government in power. It is my wish that Guyanese in and out of the legislature, with malice towards none and goodwill towards all, will settle down to the engaging task of binding up the nation's wounds and charting a new course, a new road of peace and prosperity for Guyana. Which even the blind will be able to recognize without the use of Braille. But I should hope that there will be certain attitudinal changes easily recognizable when 1976 comes. The colonial heritage of ours is difficult for many of us to cast off. Especially those who might have benefited in some direct or oblique way from the old colonial system. But comrades, unless we are prepared as a people to reject the old colonial values and attitudes towards work and production and productivity, we will be doomed to continue in a new state of servitude. We may have a national anthem, we may have a flag, we may have a national motto, we may have the trappings of independence, but we would be lacking the heart of independence the real independence, an independence which comes from a control of our economy and its resources and the exploitation of our resources for the benefit of the people and lifting the standard of living of the ordinary man, of the little man, of the master. I had not intended to speak this long, because, as I told you, I had to be in Georgetown by seven. But I thought I should leave some of my thoughts with you, so that there would be no misconception or misunderstanding with respect to what government's plans are with us. So far as education and training are concerned, and no misconception with respect uh, to what we all are expected to contribute. And I take this opportunity where parents are present to speak, because commerce is not the children, it's the parents. I have had an experience of a young girl who went to one of the premier, so it said, girls' schools, telling her parents when she had finished her A-levels that she wanted to do agriculture. And hearing that that young girl was told by her mother, did I educate you at bishops for you to be a farmer? Forgetting, of course, that the Prime Minister's wife, who is a senior mistress of bishops, is a farmer. It's the parents, comrades. And many of us flatter ourselves and tell ourselves, oh, the children are awful, the children are this. But it's we, the adults, who are steeped in superstition and backwardness. And it's we who need emancipation. It is not difficult to persuade the young to embark upon changes. It's the parents who are usually the stumbling block. 
I speak to you as a fellow parent. But enough of that, you'll hear more of it from time to time. The plan unfolds. You invite me to come and be with you. I was looking at this bill. It's a little older than I, and indeed it looks so. And I am thinking, that the surroundings in which people, especially young people, are trained must, as far as possible, be as comfortable as possible and as attractive as possible. Of course, we are poor. We cannot build palaces for schools. But I think we can make this auditorium more attractive and we can make it larger. You notice I didn't say government can. <laughs> I said we can. And as I did in December 1971, I'd like to make another offer in July 75, but hope to return to see the result of our joint efforts much earlier than three and a half years after. I'd like the principal and staff, the parent teachers associations and all well wishing you Amsterdam. You're the ancient country, you know. You produced the first Prime Minister's wife. <laughs> you produced the second Secretary General of the Commonwealth. You produced the first chancellor of the judiciary. You have produced well in the past. But let not the phrase in the past be the significant phrase in my statement. You shouldn't have. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
That in the past, at least, they tend to move one step ahead of the other. Before we reflect, not on our achievements, you've heard of our achievements, you know of our achievements. Before we reflect on the system that came after the abolition of slavery, and incidentally, the Jamaicans have a point. For the Jamaicans, 1834 is of little or no significance. The significant date for them is 1838, after the period of apprenticeship had come to an end. Maybe there were less revolutionary than we were, they didn't have their demons, though they had their maroon. But before we reflect on the system that came hereafter, or thereafter, let me just give you a little detail. Towards the time of the abolition of slavery, when the consciences of the British legislators and public, we were told in the history books which we had to read, had been stirred had been already stirred. In July the 9th, on July the 9th, 1821, a local guide was published. Reminding persons that no slave is permitted to walk after eight at night. Unless he has a pass or a lantern, must have a pass to show or a lantern to show his face, perhaps otherwise his face was too dark to be seen at night on pain of being put 
in the stock. And the owner being obliged to pay two dollars for his or her release, exclusive of the charge for boarding such things. Now tell me, what's the difference between him and a hog? Or him and a goat? Or him and a jackal? Or him and a hog? The only difference is how much you pay. And perhaps when you look at 1521 and compare it with 1984, what with the valuation and the basket and all that sort of thing, two dollars would be somewhat more than the twenty dollars I understand you have to pay now. That was the slave who was brought here to be modified by the influence of Christianity. But in the stocks, if he walks at night after it without a pass or a lantern. They might have added that if he smiled, it would be all right. Now, sugar a continued dominant in this country. There are. In the case of the descendants of Africans, who tended to be urbanized in the villages, the punishment for them was easy time. Flood their villages, destroy their crops, and force them into impecuniosity. In the case of the Indians, rule them with a heavy hand and ride them with whip and spur. Promise them a shilling a day when you are picking them up in India, but give them four shillings a day when you bring them to British Guyana. The Indians were human beings too. And there was strike starting from the 1840s, right through, and culminating in the 1948 resistance and more, which we commemorate each year in June. If one is spitefully academic, one would be inclined to differentiate between slavery and indentured labor. But the conditions of living were hardly different. The disrespect for human dignity was identical. And a hair's breadth separated the economic potential of either group during this terrible period. All right. By 1953, as a result of a national struggle, when it was recognized that the trade union movement alone was not capable of carrying the fight to the imperialists. The struggle on the political front developed more fully. I'm not suggesting that there was no struggle on the political front. But I would say that by 1953, the struggle on the political front developed more fully and there was a greater coordination of effort between the trade unions and the political grouping. What happened? 
a constitution was suspended. Why? Because they say we were going communist. Now, we are told that it is of the essence of democracy that the people should be permitted to choose the form of government which they want. But I am reminded of a certain head of state, not in the Caribbean, who called together the three persons who were to choose a vice chancellor of a particular university. And he said, gentlemen, you may choose anyone you like as vice chancellor, provided it's one of these two. So far as the British are concerned, you're free to choose your form of government provided it is acceptable to the British. That was their philosophy in 1953. What is their present philosophy now? We shall see later. In 1966, we gained independence. Uh, was slavery abolished in 1966? I say no. Well, in 1970, we became a cooperative republic. Was slavery abolished? I say no. We're both working from home. The high-speed internet is absolutely critical. Get Fios, the 100% fiber optic network with upload speeds as fast as downloads. Internet plans start at just $39.99. And now when you switch, get up to 12 months of the Disney bundle on us. Only from Verizon.